Part One. George and Lisa are overseas students studying in Britain. They are returning home for the summer holidays. First, you have some time to look at questions one to three. That'll be twenty-three dollars, right? There's your change. Have a nice trip. Oh, I'll just get your bags out of the boot. Thank you very much. Now, George, let's find the check-in desk. Yes, but with all the changes they have made here at the airport, I'm not sure where the check-in desk is. I know it's strange, isn't it? Why don't we ask for help? Good idea. What about that man sitting down over there? Which one? The one with the hat on and in the trolley? No, the one with the uniform behind the table. I'll ask him. Excuse me, could you tell me where the check-in desk for France Air is, please? Oh, um, let me think. The best way to get there would be to turn left at the end there, where the cafe is, and then go straight ahead until you're opposite the departure gate's entrance. Oh, no, 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 no. S sorry. Um, it might be quicker to turn right as soon as you get past the cafe, and keep going along the corridor until you come to the sliding doors at the end, on the left. Yes, that's it. All the check-in counters are in a hall there. I'm pretty sure France Air is directly to your left as you walk in the hall. Thanks a lot. So it's the left past the cafe, and then right opposite. The bookshop. You can't miss it. Come on then, Lisa. We don't want to be late, and I want some time to get a cup of coffee and look around the bookshop. Okay, George. But I want to go to the restroom first. I'll meet you at the check-in desk. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions four to ten. Good morning. Can I help you? Yes, I would like to check in for flight FA four nine two. Very good.、Uh, can I have your ticket and passport, please? Oh yes, here you are. Okay, thanks.、Uh, if you could just put your suitcase on the scales. Oh, I have this extra box that I want to take as well. Okay, well that's extra luggage, so I'll have to get you to fill out an excess baggage declaration certificate. It'll cost extra, I'm afraid. Let me see. Um, forty dollars exactly. If the total value of your contents is under four hundred dollars. Oh well, what's the form for? It's just a form you have to fill out so that if there are any problems, we'll know where you are and how to contact you. So if you can give me a few details, I'll key in the information. Okay then. Your passport says your name is Lavier. Is that right? Yes, George Lavier. George. Uh. L A V I L L I E R S. Good. Now nationality: French. No, wait a minute. It's a Swiss passport. Well, yes, I live in France, but I was born in Switzerland. Swiss. Very good. Flight number F A four nine two. Destination is Paris. Are you connecting with any other flight in Paris, or will you be staying there? I'm spending my vacation in Paris. Well, Sèvre. Just outside Paris. Okay. So, what's the phone number there? Um, let me think. The country code for France is uh thirty-three, and the number is one nine eight six one four five three seven. Right. So that's three three one nine eight six one four five three seven. Yes, that's it. And can you tell me briefly what you have in the box? 
Well, there are some books, just university textbooks from last semester, some clothes, and uh, oh, yeah, my computer discs. Okay, thank you. And what would be the approximate value of the contents?、Mm, quite a bit, actually. About、um, yes, about one hundred and fifty dollars. That's all. There's your receipt for the box, your passport and ticket, and here is your boarding pass. Gate seven. You can board the plane in about thirty-five minutes. Have a nice flight. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You'll hear a radio program on the process of making beer. First, you have some time to read questions. Hello and welcome to Gourmet Evening. And this week we're looking at the world's popular beverage, a great favourite today, beer. And in the studio to tell us all about it is Clark Maxwell. Beer is one of my personal favourite beverages, and I've got a number of facts, tips, and trivia about beer to share with you. So, who invented beer and when? What is beer made of? Actually, historians are not entirely sure when beer was invented, but they guess that beer was created accidentally by early nomadic tribes roughly ten thousand years ago. The four primary ingredients are malt, hops, yeast, and water. Malt, which gives the beer a sweet taste, is made from barley soaked in water until its husks open and sprout. The sprouts are then dried and crushed. The small flowers of the hops vine are added partly because they taste bitter, helping balance the sweetness of the malt. Hops prevent the growth of bacteria that can spoil beer. Yeast is responsible for fermentation, which creates the alcohol and carbonation. Beer makers sometimes use additives or substitutes for malt or hops. Substitutes such as corn or rice can make a beer lighter or cheaper to produce. Adding fruit gives beer a fruity taste. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions. Beer is not high in alcohol, as we know. The lowest type, light beer, contains no more than two percent alcohol, and the highest may reach six percent. Other drinks, such as wine, are more alcoholic. Wine contains eight to twenty percent alcohol. But that is not to say drinking beer is no danger at all. Like all alcoholic beverages, beer can make it difficult to drive and think clearly. Excessive drinking can also lead to liver damage, high blood pressure, stomach ulcers, and other health problems. However, beer also helps prevent some health problems when consumed in moderation. Beer contains a moderate number of vitamins and minerals. Studies have shown that small amounts of alcohol can reduce the risk of heart disease. Beer also contains selenium, a mineral that promotes bone growth and helps reduce the risk of osteoporosis. I suppose many of you think beer can give you a beer belly, but you are mistaken. Genes determine how fat is deposited. No food or drink can create fat deposits in specific areas of the body. 
as with all foods, the more calories you consume, the more likely they are to be stored as fat and cause weight gain. Beer contains no fat and averages 150 calories per serving. Well, one more thing. Pay attention to the storage and containers of beer. They will affect its taste. It's a mistake that the taste of beer improves with age, like that of some wines. Beer is a food product that will eventually become stale. It should be stored in a cool, dark location before consumption, and the color of a bottle can influence the flavor. Brown bottles block out light that reacts with the hops, which could damage the flavor. Green or clear bottles provide little or no protection from light damage. Do you know which country drinks the most beer? Although Britons consume a great deal of beer each year, it's not even on the list of big consumers. Actually, the Czech Republic consumes the most beer, at 156 liters per person per year, followed by Ireland and Germany. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You'll hear a discussion between two students and their teacher on a planned charity event. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. So, are you making any progress with your plans for our annual charity event? I guess first things first, have you decided what charity it will be in aid of this year? We're thinking about Help the Children in Africa, sir. Well, that's Mark's idea, sir. But I myself prefer a local charity called The Meals on Wheels. I'd have to agree with Laura on this one, Mark. After all, we're supposed to be giving back to the local community and... Although helping African children is a very worthy cause, it's a little outside our remit. That settles it, I guess. Moving on from the beneficiary question, have you made a decision on what type of event it will be? Yes, we plan on doing something a little different this year. We're calling the event Balloonathon. Basically, we're going to offer balloons for sale to all the students. Balloons? I don't see where you're going with this. Why would they want to buy a balloon? Well, here's the thing. We don't actually give them the balloon. Instead, we'll write their name on it along with the special phone number and then we'll release all the balloons into the air. When they fall to the ground, if a person finds one and rings a special number, then both he and the student who bought the balloon will win a gift voucher. That sounds like an excellent idea, guys. Well thought out. This balloonathon has a real novelty value attached to it, don't you think? Exactly what we said, sir. The only drawback is that the gas you put into the balloons is rather expensive. How much? About £20 per canister, and we'll need about 10 And how many balloons are you planning to blow up? Well, there are over a thousand students in the school, so if even one third of the students buy one, We'd need about 350 balloons. We've decided to order 500 so we don't run out. The good thing is we can return the canisters of gas if we don't use them, and the balloons aren't expensive, so there's no real risk of us spending a lot of money without getting a good return. You two have really thought this one out. I'm impressed. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30.
Thank you, sir. So, how much money do you think we can raise? Well, each balloon costs about one p, and when it's filled with gas, it's going to cost us about fifty pence. We reckon that if we sell our balloons at a price of one pound fifty, and we sell all five hundred of them, we'll end up making a profit of one pound per balloon. So that's five hundred pounds in total. That's fantastic, and it gets better, sir. We've secured a sponsor for our event, who's going to give us a thousand pounds. How did you find a sponsor? The balloon company we approached about buying the balloons asked us if we'd be interested in letting them sponsor us too. What's in it for them? They're going to print their logo on every balloon. I think you've done a good deal there. Thank you, sir. So, do we have your approval to confirm our order? Absolutely. But you know, I think we can sell more balloons if we set our minds to it. So why not order double the amount, a thousand instead of five hundred? We're going to need more than ten canisters of gas then. Double the amount, presumably. Correct. Okay, let's go for it. Let's make this year's charity event our most successful ever. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecturer in education talking about some experiments done in the USA to investigate the effects of reducing class sizes. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. All over the world, there are passionate arguments going on about how educational systems can be improved. And of all the ideas for improving education, few are as simple or attractive as reducing the number of pupils per teacher. It seems like common sense, but do these ideas have any theoretical basis? Today, I want to look at the situation in the USA and at some of the research that has been done here in America. On the effects of reducing class sizes. In the last couple of decades or so, there has been considerable concern in the United States over educational standards here, following revelations that the country's secondary school students perform poorly relative to many Asian and European students. In addition, statistics have shown that students in the nation's lower-income schools in the urban areas. Have achievement levels far below those of middle class and upper middle class schools. So, would reducing class sizes solve these problems? Well, we have to remember that it does have one obvious drawback: it's expensive. It requires more teachers and possibly more classrooms, equipment, and so on. On the other hand, if smaller classes really do work, the eventual economic benefits could be huge. Better education would mean that workers did their jobs more efficiently, saving the country millions of dollars. It would also mean that people were better informed about their health, bringing savings in things like medical costs and days off sick. So, what reliable information do we have about the effects of reducing class sizes? There's plenty of anecdotal evidence about the effect on students' behavior, but what reliable evidence do we have for this? Let's have a look at three research projects that have been carried out in the USA in the last couple of decades or so. The first study I'm going to look at took place in the state of Tennessee in the late 1980s. It involved some 70 schools. 
In its first year, about 6,400 students were involved, and by the end of the study, four years later, the total number involved had grown to 12,000. What happened was that students entering kindergarten were randomly assigned to either small classes of 13 to 17 students or regular-sized classes of 22 to 26. The students remained in whatever category they had been assigned to through the third grade, and then, after that, they joined a regular classroom. After the study ended in 1989, researchers conducted dozens of analyses of the data. Researchers agree that there was significant benefit for students in attending smaller classes, and it also appears that the beneficial effect was stronger for minority students. However, there's no agreement on the implications of this. We still don't know the answer to questions like how long students have to be in smaller classes to get a benefit, and how big that benefit is, for example. The second project was much larger and took place in California. Like the Tennessee study, it focused on students from kindergarten through to grade three, but in this case, all schools throughout the state were involved. The experiment is still continuing, but results have been very inconclusive, with very little improvement noted. And the project has, in fact, also had several negative aspects. It meant an increased demand for teachers in almost all California districts. So the better-paying districts got a lot of the best teachers, including a fair number that moved over from the poorer districts. And there were a lot of other problems with the project. For example, there weren't any effective procedures for evaluation. All in all, this project stands as a model of what not to do in a major research project. A third initiative took place in the state of Wisconsin at around the same time as the California project began, and it's interesting to compare the two. The Wisconsin project was small. Class sizes were reduced in just 14 schools, but it was noteworthy because it targeted schools at which a significant proportion of the students were from poor families, compared with California's one-size-fits-all approach. Analysts have found that the results are very similar to the Tennessee Project, with students making gains that are statistically significant, and that are considerably larger than those calculated for the California Initiative. Now, I'd like to apply some of these ideas to the latest... That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.